Good evening. Good evening, Devrai. <laughs> Welcome. This is our national speaker series. My name is Shantanu Bose, and I serve as the provost of DeVry University. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jim Lezinski. He's the vice president of US sales and service at Google. Jim has over 25 years of marketing experience and 10, actually 11 years, you said, mm -hmm. um, at Google itself. Jim has worked extensively with name brand marketing and advertising agencies such as DDB, um, March 1st, Euro RGCS, is that right? Euro RCG, yes. Jim is an avid marketing educator. He lectures at Northwestern and at Notre Dame. So we're really proud to have Jim today. And then I can say one other thing. DeVry stands for technology. And we have a broader definition of technology. We define technology as bringing together four things, people, processes, data, and devices. And we're going to see how we take this broad definition of technology, teach our students, teach our graduates on how you use these four elements together to solve business problems. Today is an example of how you do that, and Jim is going to highlight that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Welcome. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Well, thank you, Provost. Uh, good evening. Uh, greetings from Google Chicago. Nice to have so many of you here with us in person. And nice to um, uh, have so many of you joining us on the live stream. Uh, greetings to the live stream participants. Uh, what I'm going to do is spend about 40 minutes or so, uh, if we could switch to my slides, talking through um, some observations about what we see here at Google is happening in the world. Um, and I'm going to give you a hypothesis that what's happening is something that we call the new normal. I'll unpack that hypothesis, explain what we mean by the new normal, uh, as that is what we're all facing in the, the current and future state of um, technology of business and certainly of marketing. And then what we'll do is, um, because I know DeVry and DeVry students are in particular, um, if nothing, focused on practical application as opposed to theory or conceptual, we're going to um, share with you five key questions to be thinking about to succeed and thrive in this era of the new normal. Okay, sound good? And then we'll save some time for questions at the end, both here in the room in Chicago as well as across the live stream. So with that, fasten your seatbelts, uh, away we go. So um, when Google was founded some 13 years ago or so, our founders, Larry and Sergey, started with a series of precepts to build the company on. And one of those precepts is start with the end user and all else will follow. Now, user is a word that we use here at Google, uh, used in the technology field, as, as you're well aware, uh, meaning the target audience, the end buyer, the consumer, or the customer. And um, this is a, a picture of my fictitious glamour family. That's not actually my family. Uh, but I'm sure it looks like my family. It looks like your family. It looks like everybody's family, right? Um, the living room, uh, to the extent that, that people are together, whether it's your family, your friends, your neighbors, your roommates, um, you know, looks like this, right? Multiple devices all happening at the same time. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a lot about mobile tonight. But mobile, of course, is the, the prime driver, what's really new and different here over, I would say, in particular, the past 18 months um, that has radically changed user behavior. And so because of that, you know, we reached a tipping point, uh, according to Nielsen, a little over a year ago, that proverbial moment where you know, the dog has caught the fire truck, where the goldfish has jumped out of the bowl. And that is where, you know, if you follow the user and user behavior back to that living room scene, uh, time spent online now exceeds time that consumers, that users, certainly in the US and in many markets around the world, are spending with TV. So you see that tipping point happening here in late, late 2015, just over a year ago, where you know something like four and a half hours had been spent previously on TV, and that was about four hours and 15 minutes. And you see that flip on the far right-hand side, digital time has now moved from under five hours to over five and a half hours. Now, this is the point where I'll remind all of you, and I know you're well aware of this, that you know, we don't market, we don't do business to averages. We do that to very targeted, specific audience segments. So I want to use the disclaimer, your mileage may vary. I know I show this slide and people say like, hey, wait a minute, who the heck spends five hours watching TV? I don't. I'm busy. I'm doing a job. I'm going to class, et cetera. Again, that's an average between 
you know, my late grandfather who, you know, spent 10 hours a day with TV because that was where he was at in his life stage, and, you know, my 21-year-old son who spends barely a few minutes each day on TV. So this is averages. Understand your target. Understand your user. But the macro picture is, right, digital has now moved from sort of a sideshow, a, a side dish, if you will, in terms of where people are spending their time to the center of the plate, the main show, uh, the main entree. And so as marketers, we need to think about what that means for us. And it's not just digital overall. I, I foreshadowed moments ago about how you know, within that digital is really you know, the current king and the future king or queen of, of how time is spent within that digital slice. We're seeing huge increases across all demographics in time spent with digital. So you know, the upshot of this and you know, the hypothesis uh, that we're seeing here at Google and, and you're seeing and, and most of the industry is seeing is that you know, we're now at the point where generally everyone and everything is online, and within online, you know, mobile is where people are spending time, including I'm seeing some of you on your mobile phones right here and now. Um, but you know, whether it's uh, you know, mom target shopping in the store, whether it's you know, seniors trying to get Medicare, healthcare information, um, you know, whether it's kids trying to learn, all of those different things are being spent online. And we'll talk a little bit about these sort of micro moments or snacklets as you see in the bottom left here of, you know, even when people have five minutes between meetings, waiting for a bus or waiting for a train, you know, in between phone calls. Like, people are now using those moments productively and maybe not so productively with games and entertainment um, online and on mobile in particular. And so what does that mean for us as business people? What does that mean for us as marketers? That means, and these are you know, Mary Meeker data here. Um, she does an excellent job forecasting these kinds of things. That means of all advertising dollars, marketing dollars that are spent in the US, um, essentially everything that's not mobile will more or less hold steady for the foreseeable future. And all incremental marketing money, incremental advertising funds, will be in mobile, and that's that top wedge where you see it growing. Now again, your mileage may vary depending on your business, depending on your customer, depending on your target audience or your geography. Uh, you know, that's not to say that there might be an opportunity to lean in more with TV or lean in more with yellow pages or radio, of course. But you know, what I wanna show you here is the macro picture of industry is you know, mobile is where attention is growing and consumer time is being spent, and therefore, as marketers, our job is to follow the user, and this is what we see happening for the foreseeable future. So you know, all of this by way of saying that, that you know, this, this online, always connected digital life is for our target audiences that we as business people are trying to you know, attract to our franchise, Digital is that new normal. It's no longer a side dish. It's no longer optional for us to be successful in business. It is our new reality moving forward. And so I want to show you some things that you know, represent this new normal, and then we'll unpack some five questions to do about it. So, so look, even things that we long knew as digital have radically changed in this new normal underneath our noses. So you know, let's start with a, a, a oldie but goodie, Google Maps. Uh, any of you guys familiar with use Google Maps? Yes, thank you. We, we we're happy for your support there. And Google Maps is a great product. And in sort of the previous normal, you knew Google Maps as a, a device, as a tool, as a utility to help you as a user figure out how to get from a physical place A to physical place B, right? Like maybe some of you even used Google Maps to figure out how to get to our offices here in the West Loop today. Um, and it still does that, and that's great. But in this new normal, because of time spent, our maps team has said, wow, you know, there's lots of things that people would like help with directionally that are not outside physical places. But in fact, you know, most all of the Home Depot stores, most of the IKEA stores, all the Westfield malls, many of the major airports now, as you can see here, have Google Maps indoor mapping completed. So next time you're you know, looking for um, some assemble yourself furniture and you can't figure out what aisle it's in or you, know, you need a, per, a tool or a screw and you can't find an orange apron in the busy store on a Saturday, you can go to Google Maps in this world of new normal and zoom in and see what aisle that's in. So something that we thought we knew even has changed in the new normal. Um, you know, other applications of this sort of new normal in the mobile world, uh, I stayed at a Hilton in uh, Columbus, Ohio 
last week. I lose track of time. And, um, you know, the old normal was that you might make an online reservation, you know, either directly through Hilton or maybe you prefer Expedia or Orbitz or some of the other options to do that. Um, so, you know, online reservations has been normal for a long time. But, of course, then I get an email from them that says, we look forward to your visit. Through our app on your mobile phone, you're able to now select your actual floor and actual room. And you can do this across most all Hiltons around the world, right? Which you've been able to do on an airplane for a while, right? Like, do you want seat, window seat in row 27 or an aisle seat in row 9? Right? You can now start to do this um, mobile here, uh, whether it's on your tablet or whether it's on your mobile phone, which is kind of a really cool thing, right? And it almost makes you wonder, like, wow, why, why haven't we been able to do this before, right? You sort of show up at the front desk and hope they give you a nice room, not next to the ice machine in the elevator, right? Well, now, in this world of new normal, you can do exactly that. Other things that we thought we knew that have changed in this world of new normal is the blurring of the lines between what is online video or online entertainment content and what is TV. So, you know, simple example of that, that's the, our um, $35 Chromecast device on the left-hand side here. But whether it's that or whether you have Apple TV or an Amazon Fire Stick or a Roku Stick, all in that, you know, $35, $40, $45 price range, you plug that into the USB or a DVI port, sorry, in the back of your TV. And now, if you're watching, you know, Mad Men old episodes on your tablet that stream through Chromecast on your TV, are you watching TV or are you watching digital video or what is that exactly, right, in this new normal? I'm not quite sure what that is. That's a different kind of experience. And, you know, again, we can split hairs as business people or marketers on exactly what that is. But, you know, users, it's just they're watching the content that they want to watch when and the way they want to watch it on the screen they want to watch it, which is pretty standard in the new normal. Uh, I mentioned my 21-year-old son, my youngest, is 17. And, you know, if I were to go ask her, uh, what time is Parks and Rec on and what channel is it on? She couldn't tell you the answer to either of those two. She says, well, I watch it on Hulu when I want, Dad, right? And this is kind of the new normal here. Um, you know that, um, you know, for many of the late night TV shows, whether it's Saturday Night Live, the cold opens that Alec Baldwin has been doing, or whether it's the monologue on Jimmy Kimmel or Conan, um, you know, a, a large portion of the viewership is not sort of real-time sequential, but it's on YouTube the following morning. So again, that's a new normal for something that we thought we knew, right? We thought we knew Conan is a TV show. But if people are watching it in larger and larger proportions in you know, two minute cut up sound bites uh, the next morning on, on YouTube, is that TV anymore or is that online video? Good old classic search, something that you thought you knew has changed as well. You know, we all knew search in sort of a recent normal as a place where if I had questions, I could go open up Google or whatever my favorite search engine is and ask a question. Best girl's bike for 12-year-old, 60656, under $150, right? And Google would bring me back or Bing would bring me back an answer. Uh, and then I'd get my answer. I'd turn it off, put, put the phone in my pocket, close my computer, and go on with my life. But in this new normal, where you know, users are always connected, always on, you know, search has evolved from something that's um, reactive in the background unless you ask it a question, to sort of your always on sidekick or always on assistant. These are three of my devices and three of the things that I've done. I was in Paris recently. And um, uh, you know, because your phone, you know, again, with, with your permission, knows where you are at any point in time, I can, through voice search, and you know, something like a third of all of our mobile searches are, are done via voice, not typing anymore, um, I can just ask it, where is my hotel? Now, because I gave Google the permission to connect my Gmail and my search together and my Google Calendar, in milliseconds, Google can go in and say, oh, like there probably was a hotel reservation or a hotel information entered in his Google Calendar, and this was the place I was staying. Now, we know the address of that through Google Maps. We know where I'm at because the phone knows where you are, and it can come back and give me walking directions back to my hotel. Right? There's a very different kind of sidekick virtual assistant experience than best kids' bikes under 150 bucks, right? Uh, when will my package arrive? That's another one I did. I ordered something a while back from Crate and Barrel. And you ask it that voice search. It goes into my Gmail. It sees an order confirmation for that e-commerce purchase. Takes the 11-digit tracking number, drops it in FedEx.com, understands that it'll be on my porch this afternoon, and in a millisecond comes back and says it'll be here today. 
right? And of course, you know, the classic use case is every time I'm at Newark and my flight is delayed, um, you know, it pushes that in advance to me because it knows I've got that flight book. So these are some just, again, things that we thought we knew in a recent normal have rapidly evolved to be very different in this new normal. Games is another one, right? Anybody play this over the course of the summer, mess around a little bit with Pokemon? Um, you know, we all thought that, that console games was normal, right? And I've still got a collection of Xboxes and Playstations and Nintendo uh, console sets in my basement. And, you know, hey, it's fun to play classic Donkey Kong and, you know, put the cartridge in or put the disc in. Um, but sort of now in a user-connected, mobile-first world, um, augmented reality games like this, I, I think, are going to be some things that we see in, in a new normal. Um, and just by the way, that, that middle shot here um, is a Zubat that was um, worth a bunch of points. That's actually me on a panel at a conference recently. And um, one of the users uh, was in, in the audience of members was um, getting some points on uh, Pokemon Go <laughs> during my speech. So maybe there's one out here on the stage <laughs> right now while we're speaking. I don't know. If there is, go ahead and capture them. Um, you know, I spent a week out at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas earlier this year. I mentioned voice search and voice, uh, virtual assistant, uh, a few seconds ago, a few moments ago. Um, virtual assistants, Amazon Echo, uh, Alexa, the Dot, et cetera, you know, was sort of the, the talk of the town at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Um, we also have a, a product here called Google Home that's powered by Google Assistant. Um, and I think, you know, voice going mainstream is going to be something that we see. I have actually both of those devices in my own home. Uh, and when um, my son was home with a bunch of his college roommates for uh, Thanksgiving earlier this year, you know, there's no one smarter than a, a high school a junior other than a college junior, right? And so, you know, like, you, hey, what, what, what year was Stripes made, right? Uh, Bill Murray was in that. What, what year was that? It was 1981. No, it was 1982, right? So all the college kids are like, you know, in the Old West, they pull their phones out of the holster, right? Like, who can, who can be faster to get that answer? But it was magic to watch in the course of like literally 24 to 36 hours, that behavior changed to a new normal where people would just go, you know, hey, Alexa, hey, Google, right? What year was that Bill Murray movie? Right? And so people's behavior in this new normal morphs very rapidly. And, you know, again, um, you know, these are not trivial investments, but these are $125 devices, which, you know, given the average household income in the U.S. is fifty to 55000 You know, it's a non-trivial investment. But we're not talking thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to bring the magic of, you know, what was like the Star Trek computer into everyone's home here. So, you know, if um, what happens at CES is any prediction of future behavior and, and future devices in the U.S. And, and globally, I think we'll see a lot more of this in the new normal. Um, you know, we, we, we would be remiss not to talk about virtual reality. We talked about augmented reality a few minutes ago. Um, that's the Facebook Oculus device there on the left. Um, that's our Google Cardboard device uh, that you see here on the right. A um, couple of different takes on how to, to do augmented reality. Um, Facebook's is a much higher end experience, um, you know, much more uh, high quality graphics, um, but you know, much more for the masses, user friendly for everyone take on it with Google Cardboard, uh, which is a, a free product, right? Um, you know, I've got a link here for those of you who haven't played with this. You know, we now have um, an increasing amount of videos up on YouTube, just regular YouTube on your phone or, or on your computer, that are 360 degree enabled. This is just a simple video the Swiss Air Force put up, I think, of a couple of F-18s flying in formation. And with your mouse, you can just like literally, you know, drag the mouse left and right, and you can look, you know, at the, the wing squadron leader, and you can look at the plane on the right and the plane on the left, and up and down, all this kind of stuff. Um, which, of course, is even much cooler when you look at that through the, through the glasses. Um, but anyway, you know, that little simple video has got something like 10 million views just because people like to drag the mouse and see what's going on all across it. Concerts are increasingly using this as well. It's kind of fun to not only look at the stage, but to turn around and pan the rest of the crowd up and down, et cetera. You see some interesting things when you get a 360-degree view of a concert. But you know, VR is, in many respects, a game changer. Um, this is a couple of Chicago Public School students. These three girls um, got to see virtual reality the first time last summer when 
the Google team here did an event over in Daly Plaza to expose CPS to, to magic of what this new normal is. Uh, and look, they had that same face expression of magic and wonderment as the anchors of CBS this morning did when we went and showed them for the first time. So sort of no matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, um, you know, uh, VR is an amazing game changer. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that helped break that through was uh, our partnership with the New York Times. That's my neighbor's driveway. He still subscribes to the actual paper, you know, when they like print it on paper and drop it in your driveway. I keep saying you can get it on your tablet. But anyway, um, uh, last summer, as part of a, a promotion, um, they actually flat pack and dropped um, Google Cardboard devices uh, to all New York Times subscribers. And if you haven't had a chance, uh, every week now the New York Times does, I don't know, about three, four, five, six stories that are filmed in virtual reality. And, you know, uh, New York Times reporters often talk about the fact that um, this is in some respects a time machine. So you all know that famous uh, photo from, um, I guess it was VE Day in Times Square, you know, with the sailor kissing the nurse, right? Like, you can picture that, but when I say that, you see it in sort of flat 2D black and white. But imagine if you could stand in Times Square and see that happening and walk around that couple and experience it as if you were there. Well, that's what the New York Times is doing from this point forward. So, you know, whether it's happy stories or tragic stories, like when the Air Berlin, um, you know, German plane crashed, they did that at the debris field in 360 degrees. So at any point from now forward, you know, anyone, your kids, your grandkids, et cetera, will be able to stand there and experience that news story as if you were there, right? So a virtual time machine. So these kinds of things are increasingly becoming the new normal as well. And you know, it's pretty cool. You can do it. There's a little gizmo um, that you can buy, hook it to your bike helmet, hook it to your bike handlebars, to your snowboard. It's about 375 bucks. You can buy it off Amazon and create your own. HD 360 degree or virtual reality video. Um, or you could do it for free. We have an app up in the Google Play Store uh, called Cardboard Camera, and you can go in your backyard or wherever and take some series of pictures and it will stitch it together into a, a, a virtual reality uh, full 360 degree film for you for absolute free. Uh, and, you know, look, Viewmaster is also a little new normal. Many of us grew up and you know, had those little kind of wheels that you would drop in and you could look at the pyramids or, you know, Leaning Tower of Pisa or Eiffel Tower or what have you. Um, well, you know, that's sort of the old normal. The, the new normal, whoops, for the new normal for that is you drop your smartphone in it and Viewmaster operates as a, a virtual reality 360 degree viewer for kids. So, you know, even things we thought we knew have changed. Um, car buying is another application of this, the, the, the new big SUV by Volvo, the SUV of the year actually, the XC90, uh, for a test drive now will, instead of mailing a brochure to their best prospects, they mail them this branded VR viewer. You drop your smartphone in it and now you can sit in the car, you can walk around the car, you can drive it in the snow, you can drive it in the country, you can drive it in the sun, you can drive it in the city, whatever you want. So, you know, is that the new normal for a test drive moving forward? Um, don't know, but I mean, we're starting to see some things like this uh, happening. So all of this, guys, is just for me to paint the picture to give you a sense of like what's happening out there, right? You know, if our job as business people, our job as marketers is to understand consumer behavior, understand technology, you know, in the broader definition that DeVry uses as the provost unpacked for you in his opening remarks, Right, like this is a little bit of an ethnographic journey we've just gone on for 15 minutes to understand what's happening out there. So now we're gonna to pivot to the second part to say, well, all right, if the new normal has changed how people behave, then that means for us, how we think about building businesses, building brands, marketing to those people also has to change and also has to pivot. So I'm gonna take a quick sip here and we're gonna look at these five questions in the next 15 or 20 minutes. We're gonna look at, you know, to succeed in this new normal, we'll ask how are you embedding digital into the core of your business model, not just into your ads, not, right? Not just are you running digital ads, but are you actually building a digital first business? You know, sort of if you believe in the four Ps or the five Ps, the first of those Ps is product, right? So how is your product addressing new normal? Um, I talked about those little snackable moments, those micro moments when people are spending time, stealing time to get things done, to you know, do a quick search, to watch a quick video while they're waiting for the bus. Are you there in those micro moments? Do you understand and taking advantage of them? You know, a lot of talk in this new normal about big data, about uh, machine learning, about artificial intelligence, so we'll talk a little bit about that. 
Uh, we'll talk about channel boundaries, and then, you know, from a sort of tone and manner, culture, or approach, um, you know, in this new normal, to succeed, you have to be fast, agile, and you have to think not 10% better, but 10 times or 10x better. Okay, you ready? Off we go. All right, so first one is digital embedded in your business. So, you know, um, now we're not talking about digital ads, but thinking about if this is how people live, if this is how they use technology, what does it mean for your product offering? And of course, you know, Nike several generations of shoe back was already on this, and maybe you guys had one of these little Nike devices where you lift up the insole and you slip in uh, the, the sensor, and it would, you know, go to your iPhone, uh, or actually, Back when we used to have iPods, it would go to your iPod, right? So Nike was kind of early down this path thinking about, you know, how do I digify, how do I build digital products even into non-digital things? So again, I'm not talking about like a startup that builds apps, right? I'm talking about like physical, traditional companies need to be thinking about if all this new normal that's happening with their users that I showed you in the past 20 minutes, what does that mean for what I sell? Right, so Nike was early into this, um, you know, but sticking in the sports mode, you know, Sony is onto this as well. I don't know if any tennis players in the room, but this is kind of a, a cool application where um, Sony sells a device about $200 where you can unscrew the butt end of your tennis racket. You screw this little sensor back in its place. You put an app on your phone and now all of a sudden your tennis racket becomes a full digital sensor device. Uh, a sort of not alive, non-digital product instantly becomes digital, and you can see when you strike uh, a shot where it hit on the head of the racket, what was the inbound velocity, what was the exit velocity, what was the angle of that shot, what was the spin, what was the speed, all these kinds of cool things, uh, and how that's improved over time. Uh, for 199 bucks, all of a sudden, your tennis racket is now digital, right? You've digified it for the new normal. Not to be outdone, golfers in the room, I know there's some of you golf fans, same thing, you can attach this little gizmo from Zep Golf uh, to your glove, it's $149, and now all of a sudden, it analyzes your swing every time, right? Your, your golf club and your golf glove now knows the angle, the speed, the ingress, the egress, the velocity, all these kinds of cool things, and tracks improvement over time, right? It trains you to be a better golfer because we are now digifying our business, not just making digital ads. Um, you know, we're in this at Google here, you know, Nest is a, a division of Alphabet, uh, and now, you know, the thermostat, which was a non-digital thing, this is, uh, I don't know if you guys had this, I had one of these like this in my house growing up, ours actually was gold, but it was just like this, and my dad would always say, stop messing with the thermostat, right? Leave it alone, it's supposed to be 66, we're saving money, <laughs> right? Well, now in the new normal, you know, Nest devices or other devices like this, you know, are smart enough to know that it's actually, you know, as was today, guys, 38 degrees in Chicago instead of what is normal, 20, something like this for this time of year. So, you know, these are smart devices that can now optimize, you know, changes for weather that are out of the norm cycle, uh, know that you leave the house at 8.30 every day and can step back the temperature, know that you arrive at 5 and start to warm it up again at 4.30. So, again, all of these kinds of things, you know, move from being non-digital to digital in the new normal. You know, I mentioned Hilton a little bit earlier for the ability in the new normal to pick a room, but actually now, you know, a room key is digital at Hilton as well. So, you know, they don't give you a piece of plastic, so no one gives you a key anymore, but remember how we went from keys to now, like, the next thing was like the mag swipe cards where you would insert it? Well, now there's a sort of a RFID or a smart card that you'd hold up to a room. This is even beyond that. You just hold your phone up to the door, and in you go. Right? So again, you see Hilton doing a lot of cool things out front, thinking about, okay, if that's the new normal, how do I digify, digitally enable my business to win in that new normal? Um, this is a Chicago company, M. Taylor also does this as well, right? So you know, your phone has uh, five sensors built into it, and so you know, they can now bring custom-sized shirts to the masses. So no more small, medium, large, extra large. And you know, well, the sleeves fit, but the collar doesn't, or the collar fits, but the sleeves don't, or the sleeves and the collar fit, but it's too baggy. You put your phone on the counter, it will do a 360 view sensor measurement of you, and upload it, and off you go, and there's a $50 shirt, right? Pretty cool. So these are things that are taking advantage of the new normal in the first P that we all learn, digitifying your products. Okay. So, you know, think about that for, you know, the businesses that you're in, the business you're thinking of joining, the startups you're thinking of founding, right? In the new normal, it's not just about how you surround it with advertising or flash. 
your product has to be digified. Okay? Now, we talked about those moments, the user moments. Let's dive into that a little more deeply. Um, you know, micro moments. These are these little snackable seconds when, you know, I'll do it, right? You had a minute when you came up the elevator, but before the meeting started here tonight, you said, oh, let me check my phone, right? All those little snackable moments that you use to either, you know, quick escape, watch a quick video, get a relief, have a laugh, check in with your family on Facebook, or maybe get something done, right? Like, oh, you know, I want to think about going somewhere on spring break. I got five minutes. Let me quick see what the flights to Miami Beach cost, right? All those little things happen in these intent-rich micro moments. And so, um, you know, like I gave you some examples of this. This was a recent day um, where I was on a business trip. You know, there's everyday moments like this where, you know, somebody sent me a text. I had to check the time. I use my phone for that. Oh, I also still have an old school watch. But, you know, increasingly we do these things, a work email, posting vacation videos. Those are not really micro moments or snackable moments where there's an opportunity for a business or a brand to help me. But others are, right? So throughout the course of that same morning when I was in Columbus, I needed to find a place for brunch with my clients. You know, I remember that my faucet was leaky at home, and so I had a few minutes, so I wanted to watch a quick video from Kohler on how to fix my leaky faucet. I researched a vacation destination. I need some new running shoes. Like, all of these little things that happen in those seconds, opportunities for you as business people, as marketers, as brands, to come to the aid of your consumer in this new normal. Right? So, you know, when intent plus context plus immediacy comes together, you know, do you know what those micro moments are? And so just some facts, some examples that we shared, and by the way, a good source for this is, you know, we've got a website called thinkwithgoogle.com where we publish a lot of these stats and thought leadership articles and ideas and white papers. But look, you know, to this point about micro moments, since 2011, searches on Google for something near me has increased 34-fold, right? Like, not much in business going up 34x, guys, right? Um, but, you know, Chinese restaurant near me, uh, running shoes near me, coffee near me, like all of these kind of commercial queries have gone up, the proof that micro moments are exploding. Um, even in store, right? One of three shoppers now use their smartphone, they report, and we put this up also on the Think with Google site, that when they're in the store, remember I told you about Google Maps at Home Depot or Ikea, when people are in the store and they have a question, one in three are not just going and finding an associate, they're getting the answer to that right now in the store, in those micro moments. Um, and this is a new one we just posted the other day. 76% of people who do some sort of a local search, whether it's near me or, you know, Coffee West Loop or Bikes Chicago, et cetera, uh, actually then go and visit that local business within 24 hours, right? Even though they might not, you know, immediately go there, they're using those snackable micro moment time to be productive because they know tomorrow they got to go buy some shoes or this afternoon they need some coffee. So, um, you know, a Chicago company that does this very well, Walgreens, recognizes all these micro moments. And so whether it's, uh, you know, the ability to have a, a Walgreens uh, pill reminder, right? And especially I need to, can, when, what medicine do I take? When? Did I take it yet? All these kinds of things, right? So useful, helpful, relevant micro moments that they've built for me there. Uh, coupons, right? I know I need to run to Walgreens later. What have they got on sale? Hey, I know I need some deodorant. Is there a deal on Old Spice, right? All of this, they, make, they understand that that's my behavior in the new normal, and they enable that for me. And then also, you know, increasingly, you know, Walgreens is doing live doctor and pharmacist consultations that you can do um, you know, via chat or via video conference, right? Because you know what? I got five minutes here. I don't have time to go see my doctor. Maybe I'm not sick enough to go see my doctor, et cetera. But you know, if I can just get a quick answer in that micro moments uh, from Walgreens, so they, you know, I'll get what I need. So this is a really good example of a great Chicago brand uh, understanding the new normal and micro moments and optimizing against it. Okay? So again, second question in this new normal, do you understand what your micro moments are for your business, for your target, for your segment? Are you there when it matters and are you providing those answers? Because the downside of course is, right, if you're not there but your competitor is, where's the business going to go, right? Like if Walgreens isn't there and CVS is, right? So again, there's thousands of these little things, understand your consumer behavior and be there. All right, talk about data and measurement, big data, et cetera, for a minute. So, you know, clearly one of the things now uh, with data processing power, Moore's Law, you know, getting ever cheaper, um, processing power of computers and phones increasing, uh, and cloud computing as well, 
you know, data analytics and measurement are revolutionizing business overall, and increasingly that is the new normal. This is from a Google engineer. Don't ask me what this formula is. Um, but you know, data is surging by the minute, and as we're talking here, you'll see the sweep secondhand in the upper left. You know, hundreds of millions of emails are being sent in the U.S. Millions of minutes of Skype calls are happening just while we're talking. Uh, Amazon sales, tweets posted, Uber rides taken. You know, this one I particularly like. 400 hours of new original YouTube video content are uploaded every minute. Think about that, right? Um, LinkedIn accounts created, millions of Google searches made every minute, you know, hundreds of thousands of Instagram photos are posted. So all of these things are happening. All of these digital footprints give you clues as business people and marketers to how you can better connect with the audience that you care about. And so, you know, what happens is though, the explosion of this data makes it harder and harder for us to just hand choose things, right? Like, you know, you have an explosion of things, 10 to the 80th is the number of stars in the universe. You know, we've got this much data about our customers out there and available. How do you decide what to do and how do you decide, you know, how to use that data to help your business and to help your customers have a better experience? So this is obviously where machines come into play. There are some things that machines do very well to handle and process this level of data. Um, you know, we've got a group at Google called DeepMind that's building, you know, deep learning, machine learning. Um, you know, this is a game on the right called Go. It's sort of a very advanced version. I would describe it, um, as it was described to me, a very advanced version of sort of Chinese checkers, right? Where there's 10 to the 170th moves out there available during the course of a game. So think about that. Like, way more than stars in the universe are possible moves in this game. So um, last year, uh, our deep mind scientists used some machine learning. And this, again, is not where we're writing if-then rules, like old people like me when we learned how to program computers. It was always an if-then statement, right? If conditions x, y, and z existed, then computer execute command as follows. But here, right, what we're trying to do is train the machines uh, to understand some conditions and apply some logic of their own in order to understand what command to execute. So we built a machine that actually beat the best Go player in the world at this very, very complex game. And so this is what you're starting to see happen here, is that by feeding data into a machine, using deep learning, using machine learning, great things can happen. Um, and this is an example of that. So this is a, anybody been to the eye doctor lately? That's a retina. You, you know, when you put your eye up to the machine like this and they take a picture of the back of it, it looks like an orange globe like this. Um, but this is a very special retina. This is actually a retina from a diabetes patient. And you know, unfortunately, one of the very um, challenging side effects and things that people with diabetes have to watch for are eye problems, right? Um, blindness. Uh, one in three diabetics have eye challenges. And so, you know, when a normal ophthalmologist looks at this, um, you know, they might see a few thousand eyes like this over the course of their career. We actually fed 130,000 pictures like this, far more than the best ophthalmologist would see in their career, into one of our machines to help identify which are early stage pre-diseased diabetic retinas versus which are normal. And so now, you know, this can help ophthalmologists at identify these kinds of things earlier in the developed world and also access, you know, in, in places like rural Brazil where there aren't even ophthalmologists. So machine learning can improve human condition and human health and it can improve human business. So you can read the popular science article here that's linked to this. But really revolutionary things, exciting possibilities are happening, you know, whether it's in health or whether it's in business. So, you know, we're doing this. I mentioned some of these searches. Machine learning is now powering increasingly many of the searches that are coming back that you get. There are no longer engineers who are doing if-then coding. If someone types in vegan donuts near me and they live in Chicago, please return Jim's Donut Shop, right? Like early days of search work that way. Now machine learning is increasingly returning those kinds of results. So it's revolutionizing healthcare, it's revolutionizing search, it's revolutionizing business. Um, and it allows companies like MultiChoice, which is sort of the Xfinity or Comcast of South Africa, right, to put in 2.5 billion rows of data, 2.5 terabytes of customer data, and then 
use this machine learning to identify very interesting things like who are customers likely to attrit, who are customers that are good candidates for upsell, cross-sell, you know, my triple plate package, right? That's much easier for the machine to identify than if, you know, we all just stared at the data in a room as individual humans. So neat things are happening here. So um, I'm, I'm going to zip through this one here. We'll come back to that one if we have some time in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, the third question is, have you evolved data and measurement in this new normal? Let's talk about the fourth and fifth ones quickly in the, in the couple of minutes that we have remaining. So, you know, channel boundaries is an interesting thing, right? Every business, every company has like a catalog team, a store retail team, a PR team, a legal team, a marketing team, a PR team, right? All these kinds of things. And every team has their remit and every team has their budget and every team has their annual plan. But what this new normal is doing is it's blurring these lines very rapidly. So, you know, now we have this sort of notion of social commerce, whether it's, you know, buying things via LinkedIn, via Pinterest, via Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, that sort of blurs that. And so I'd ask you to think about it in a new normal, you know, how are you thinking about this? We'll start with YouTube because that's a property, you know, of ours that we know very, very well. But now you see when, you know, there's a video here about the shea butter from L'Occitane or, you know, a new eyeliner uh, product that's being offered at Sephora. Now you see increasingly the option for marketers, brands themselves or retailers, you know, to put a product being talked about in the video um, available for purchase, right? Now, you know, the early days on this, we'll see where this goes. But I look at this and I go, well, what is that, right? Is that video? Is that commerce? Is that catalog? Is that store sales? Is that the PR team? Is that the marketing team? You know, is that my merchant team? Like, who, who is that? Who does that? What is that, right? That sort of crosses all channel boundaries. And that's happening not just on YouTube. Um, you know, any of you Pinterest fans, you know, there's Bible pins now. That's happening is a good example of that from Macy's here. Um, you know, Facebook is moving into this. Um, you see this now with Instagram is letting people try to target, you know, if you back to school from target.com. Now you see the ability to shop now and buy things out of both Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then you see, you know, we've done things like, you know, shoppable hangouts or fashion shows. We've done it with Rebecca Minkoff. Um, we've done it with Diane von Furstenberg here where, you know, she does a live hangout, much like we're doing here and now on the live stream. Uh, you know, with her fans across the bottom, bless you. But of course, you see on the right-hand side all of the things in her new collection available for purchase then and there. So what is that? Is that a fashion show? Is that a website? Is that PR? Is that customer service? I don't know. It's kind of all of those things. But, um, you know, as that great business person George Costanza once said, worlds collide <laughs> for you Seinfeld fans, right? So think about how worlds are colliding and what you can do in the world of new channel boundaries. And then lastly and briefly, you know, to win, you have to change your culture, right? In this new normal, you have to act fast, you have to be agile, and you have to think 10x, not 10%. So, you know, the world's greatest marketer is, of course, this man, Ron Burgundy. <laughs> and I'm only half kidding here, guys, right? Because, um, you know, Will Ferrell's production company, Funny or Die, works with a lot of great marketers, including, in this case, uh, Fiat Chrysler. That's the Dodge Durango. And, you know, when they introduced this car, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago, um, what he did was produce 70 YouTube videos, like they literally put the car on the stage, put him in character, let the camera roll, and made 70 commercials. This provost said, I spent a lot of time before I came to Google in the advertising agency business, and you know, for most big brands, we'd make two commercials a year, maybe four commercials a year, maybe 10 if we were like crazy out there. 70 in a day, right? So talk about fast. Put them all up on YouTube. They watch to see which ones got more views, more completes, more likes, more embeds, more followers, all this kind of stuff. And then they took those handful, and that's what they put on national TV, right? So you see how this gives them a leg up by being fast, agile, understanding what's happening with users in the new normal. You know, Chevy did a good job of this on sort of the sad day when Prince died, right? Like within hours, they had the little red Corvette up here, right, on Snapchat. So, you know, being able to react fast and agile in real time. And, you know, this is hard for a lot of companies. It's like, oh, well, I got to get my legal team, but they're not available till next Thursday. And then I need to get this cleared with my PR team, but they're on an offsite and not, a, right? Like, no, you have to find a way to be able to do this in real time, uh, as Chevy did here very successfully. 
And then, you know, in terms of the process and tools used internally, um, you know, we all came from a world where somebody would create a document and then you'd email it to the next guy for reading and reviewing it and then they would email back some comments and the first guy would have to revise it and then it would get emailed back to the third guy, but the third guy was still reading the first version, right, while there was already a second version and she didn't know it, right? So all this kind of sequential processing, if you will, you know, just slows things down and gets sludgy and kludgy. And, you know, there's lots of good real-time products out there, whether it's Zoho, whether it's our Google Docs, where there's real-time collaboration that enable fast, agile, kind of simplifying, um, you know, how teams work together and, and speeding up in this new normal. And I want to just spend a minute on this notion of 10% or 10x, and I would encourage you to, like, leave with this thought, right? So, you know, in the work that you're doing, the companies that you're talking to, the internships that you have, or the jobs that you're in today or, or thinking of joining, right? Like, are, are you there, are they there to make things 10% better or 10 times better? So, you know, we're doing some work with um, automated cars, driverless cars. We've got a division called Waymo that, that, that's doing this. Introduced some nifty things at the um, um, North American International Auto Show in Detroit last week. But if I said to you guys, hey, I have two jobs, right? Come join us, come join the Google team. You can either work on making the fidelity, the resolution of backup cameras 10% clearer, or you can work on this other team that's gonna make the whole darn car drive by itself. <laughs> Who wants to work on this first team, right? Who wants to work on this second team? So you see, right, that's what attracts energy, talent, right, these, these big, hairy challenges, right? Changing the world, which we spend a lot of time thinking about here at Google. And I know that's what you guys are eager to do, and that's what you're working on you know, throughout your work at DeVry. Think about what's a huge problem out there, what's a radical solution, and what's a breakthrough technology that if you brought those three things together, you can change the world in this new normal. Okay? So I mentioned self-driving cars. You know, we're actually been experimenting at Virginia Tech, you know, delivering Chipotle burritos by drone. Like these are big game changing, right? Might work, it might not work, but these are big world changing things that make sense in a new normal, right? When everybody's got a smartphone and could order a burrito right now, how am I gonna get it to them, right? Well, I need a breakthrough technology, a radical solution, et cetera. So, you know, I'll leave you again summarizing these five things. If you believe that we're now in this new normal to succeed in it, Think about that first P. How do you embed digital in your business? Are you there in those snackable micro moments? Or are you not there and giving those moments to your competitor? Right? How are you leveraging machine learning? Machines are doing some amazing things that just are more than people can process at the moment. Right? Are you taking advantage of machine learning, whether it's with things like retina scanning that I talked about for diabetics, or whether it's for things like you know, processing your data like that cable company in South Africa? Are you blurring channel boundaries? Are you figuring out how the worlds collide? Or are you still stuck in silos in your legacy company departmental thinking? And then lastly, fast, agile, and you know, like that great business person, Ron Burgundy, think 10x. Okay. So with that, I will um, welcome you to the new normal. I'd invite you to jump right in. And if you'd like to connect with me, there I'm at on LinkedIn, and that's my Twitter. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. <clears throat>